one of the problems about speaking about my dad is probably from a very, very, very young age, he would always kind of, we thought kind of like a, like a kind of joke, ironic joke, and he would always say, no hespers, no eulogies. He would always say no eulogies. But then I realized he really meant it because just before he passed away, he said to me, no hespers, no eulogies. He was very humble, incredibly humble, private, humble. And I didn't realize, I didn't realize how, how humble. And I kind of thought it was a bit like, almost like jokey, no hespers. And I really realized he, he would be genuinely embarrassed to, for people to, to praise him. So it's a bit tricky now, because I'm not, you know, on one hand, I'll do the old yeshivish thing on one hand. You're meant to praise, you know, so I don't want to say bad things. You say good things, and, it's in, and this is, he was a tzaddik. On the other hand, I don't want to upset him. So it's like when you're married, you can never win, <laughs> right? It's always going to be the wrong move. So, so what I'll do is I'll, I'll like say a little few things, and then hopefully my dad um, will give me some, a bit of scope, just, to, just a few little things, just maybe to inspire ourselves and then do what I'm sure my dad really wants us to get on and learn Torah, which is what he was about. He would famously give a shiur of about 25 years in a shul called Ne'i Israel. And, and most synagogues, when they have Kiddush, as you can see from around the corner, they start Kiddush, and then half an hour later, the Kiddush is still going on, and half an hour later, and people... My dad would say Kiddush, they would like just about put a biscuit in their mouth and start the shiur. Didn't have, waste, didn't have time to waste. My dad wasn't about wasting time. He was about maximizing time, specifically to learn Torah. Let me just tell you a few things about Avi Meir, Binyamin Ben Beryl Lev. It's a bit creepy because yesterday when I was in Sfat, speaking a little bit about my dad, Shiri knows this um, mystic was in the room and afterwards came to Shiri and then to myself and said that he could see my father on my shoulder, smiling. So it's just now made me a little bit um, nervous right now. So if you're there, Dad, I, I love you, and I hope um, this can bring you nachos. And, you know, he was born in, in Manchester, and his, his parents weren't, weren't observant. You know, the Holocaust survivors, they managed to escape the Holocaust. They were one of the last um, people off the boat just before the Holocaust. They got from Austria to, to Manchester. <clears throat> in fact, we didn't used to be called Hill. We were Hill Freich. So your rabbi could have been called Rabbi Hilfreich, so aren't you lucky, right? It's now Rabbi Hill. Even though in Israel no one understands the whole Hill thing. Like, Rabbi Hill? Maze Hill? Ech kodvim Hill? Maze Hill? I said, Giva. Ah, Giva. So, 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 so I could have been Hilfreich. And, and when he was about six, I think 13, 14, 15, he started getting really inspired. And in fact, darling, can you show, can you show the photo, sorry to make it up, just behind the box of the rabbi there. Don't, don't show it out yet. Don't. No, no one can see it yet. Very good. So he was, he was in Manchester with, he became friendly with this um, artist from India called Henry. And together they started really getting and learning more Judaism, started keeping Shabbos. And there was this great rabbi called Dr. Schoenfeld who, who came in and about this guy Henry who was wearing a little cap a boxer an artist this Dr. Schoenfeld could look at this Henry and said there's something about you and he went up to this Henry and said one day you're going to be a prince of Israel and Henry said ah maybe you mean my great grandfather was a prince in Baghdad he goes I know but you're also going to become a prince of Israel so that good friend of my father um, is now my wife can show you the picture that's Rabbi Yaakov Hillel, Chacham Hillel, who's one of the Gedolim, who's one of the Gedolei Adar, and uh, that's what allowed us to have a connection with, with my Rabbi Rav Hillel, and they were classmates in Manchester. And my father was also a big Gadol. In his way, my father was able to, with my mother, to, to educate and infuse and inspire thousands, thousands of Jews around the world are now keeping Torah and keeping Shabbat and keeping mitzvot and having a beautiful Jewish home because my parents... Um, gave them that open home, and, and my father was a teacher par excellence. He would find a way to, to be able to teach and make it really simple, make it super simple. 
things that, that really I, I kind of, he stood for, I believe he was quintessential. Number one, he always had a sefer open. You know, one of the things about him, before Uber, you know, you got Uber? Before Uber, he was Uber. Why? Because my mother said, darling, can I go there? And he said, yes. He literally was my mum's driver. My mum never drove and doesn't drive. And my dad just drove her everywhere. He was, his shalom bite was incredible. So he was often found like waiting for her with a safer in, in, in the car or, or, or in a surgery or whatever you have. He didn't have, he didn't believe in wasting time. No such thing as wasting time. In fact, at the very end when he was very, very sick, one day I got, I got a call from the hospital saying, you've got to come and do something about your dad. And I said, oh my gosh, what's wrong? What's happened? And I came in. And so in the, in, in the reception, they said, we've never seen anything like this. You've got to do something with your dad. And I said, what's wrong? And this was a time I think he'd had a sick chemotherapy. He was really, really sick. He really wasn't well. He'd made the waiting room a yeshiva. <laughs> and his students, instead of like saying, I'm not well enough, he said, this is where we're learning today. You know, you're three o'clock, you're four o'clock, you're five o'clock. So... He would be waiting with one, one was waiting, the other one takes over, and he should have been in bed. They couldn't get him into bed, because what gave him life more than anything was learning Torah. That's what he lived for. That was his chiyot. That was his vitality. Again, I think I don't want to say too much more, otherwise he'll, he'll, he'll be upset with me. I think I have to move <laughs> swiftly on. And I, at the end, I'm going to bring it back to my dad. So let's learn some Torah and his chiyot. One thing I said last night in... in, in in Sfat, one of my dad's dreams was always to live in Israel. He always wanted to make Aliyah. And in fact, in the end, he persuaded my mom after about 15 years, we're going to make Aliyah. And when I was 11 years old, we made Aliyah. We lived in Yerushalayim. We lived in Katamon. We lived in Rehob Alam 35. And I really didn't like it because I'm a big football guy. And I'm, everyone plays basketball in those days. No one was really playing football. And as you know, I'm many things, but I'm not big. And I struggled with the whole basketball and I missed my friends. And, but more than that, my mum really didn't like it. And we had to make Yuri done. And my dad was always probably a little bit upset he never got to Israel. And I really feel ever since I've been here, I'm like f- following his footsteps. And, and, and he's really helping me along. And then when I found out miraculously and weirdly that his grandparents, when they escaped, they came to Israel and they came to Tel Aviv and they lived in Rehob Bar Kochba. Just over there. So I really feel I'm following in their footsteps and I go past their house and I'm like, hi, you know, let's do this. And I really feel emboldened and strengthened. And, and um, it's really important for everybody to know where your family are from, where they're from, where they're from, because that's how to understand your story. Your story makes more sense when you see, when you see the big picture. The Ramchal actually says that we all have a mazal. And often your strengths were your parents' strengths, were their parents' strengths. It's funny, why do you think so many doctors, their parents were doctors and their parents were doctors in the area of refuah, in the area of teaching of Rabbanim, in the area of, of making money? Let's be honest. You know, some people who do really well, whatever they touch turns to gold. How weird when their children go into business, everything they touch turns to gold. Because the Ramchal says when it comes to wealth, when it comes to education, when it, like, like teaching Torah, when it comes to healing, it's very much within the mazal. So a lot of your strengths and your successes are your family's mazal. And you should understand if you've got parents or grandparents that really excelled in a certain area, if it's kosher, if what they did was kosher, then, 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 then really look into it. Look into it, because maybe that's your mazal. Maybe that's part of your mission. We spoke to Spad about working out what your mission was. Really try and... Work out what their mission was and what their mission was. And I said, if it's kosher and it makes the world a better place, then maybe that could be your mission. So let's get it straight into Lagba Omer. Tomorrow night's a huge night in the Jewish world. More so than ever, because the Baal Shem Tov says before Mashiach, the light of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai has to come out. And that's why about 30 years ago, Lagba Omer was no big deal in the Jewish world. And then three years ago, me and Johnny can testify there was half a million Jews in Meron on that night. There's not that many of us in the world. There's 15 million of us. Probably at that time, 14 and a half. And, 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 and now that no many of us can go to Meron this year, unfortunately, there's going to be bonfires, not just in Israel, every step of the way, there's going to be bonfires everywhere. 
because the light of Rabbi Shem Bayochai is what the world needs right now, is what's going to bring Mashiach, Lag Ba'omer, has never been more important ever than this year. Maybe it will be enough, Bezrat Hashem, to bring Mashiach. So let's learn about what Lag Ba'omer is about. Let's maybe give you some, some tips how to access the R of the Zohar, how to, to the Koach of Rabbi Shem Bayochai, and, and how to achieve Dveikus with Hashem through Lag Ba'omer. So let's start off with his Rebbe, Rabbi Akiva. Tomorrow night is Lagba Omer. Tomorrow night, Lagba Omer. Tomorrow night. Join us. You know, I really, again, Sherry, you have to um, forgive my wife and myself for event after event and night after event. We've just come back from Sfas. We've got tonight, tomorrow night, we've got Lagba Omer, Wednesday night, Shabbos in the Coliseum. But Baruch Hashem, you know, that every hour has, has a beautiful light to achieve. Who's got time to waste? So, Lagba Omer. Start off with Rabbi Shimon Bayochai's teacher, Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva, till he was 40, he was a Baal Shuvah, he was the ultimate Baal Shuvah. In fact, he comes from a family of converts. He became one of our greatest ever when we go to the next world and if we have a problem with the oral law and you go to Moshe Rabbeinu, you say, Moses, Moshe Rabbeinu, please explain this, Kamara. Do you know what Moshe Rabbeinu says? Talk to Rabbi Akiva, he's the man. So that's someone who couldn't read Aleph Bet till 40 years old, became as great as Moshe Rabbeinu. Come in, Rafiq. Nice to see you. So, isn't that, isn't that amazing? That means some of you, if you feel you started a bit late, you've got time on Rabbi Akiva, everyone. You could achieve greatness, incredible greatness. And Rabbi Akiva, in fact, was what they'd called in Tel Aviv. He was anti, which is, by the way, when someone's anti-religious, I don't get upset, I get excited. Because Rabbi Akiva was anti-religious, the Gemara says. He would, when a rabbi would start talking to him, he would spit in their face. Let me explain. When someone has such passion, it means there's a lot going on underneath. The biggest issue is lethargy. The biggest, ethog- the biggest issue is no one just cares. Baruch Hashem in Israel, that doesn't happen. Everyone cares. Everyone's demonstrating. And Rabbi Akiva then was able to turn that that feeling, that fuel inside him, and he realized that actually, and the famous story was that he saw this water on a rock. You know the story, Ron? The water on a rock. He sees every day a little bit of water going on a rock. And then one day he sees that the water has created a hole in that rock. And he goes, if the, a water can create a hole in, 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 in an in an inanimate object like a rock, the Torah can make an impre- impact in me. And my kind of ego and my wall can be broken. And that's when he started wanting to learn. And Rabbi Kiva started learning. And he married Rachel, which is a very controversial marriage because she came from a very wealthy family, from Kalba Savua. He didn't want to marry this very poor Balta Shuba. He just wants to go to Yeshiva. Go, what, what are you doing? He said, if you marry Akiva, I'm cutting you out the will. It was a multimillionaire. You're not going to get anything. Again, how many of you, and again, it's a bit off topic, I can't ever help going into the relationships field, sorry. How many of you, and again, some of you might be upset with me for this, but, and maybe you should be in certain cases, but other cases you shouldn't. Listen to your parents a little bit too much. If Rachel would have listened to her parents, she wouldn't have married Rabbi Akiva and wouldn't have achieved the greatness. But she fell in love. And it was the right thing. And they were physically attracted and emotionally attracted and very much spiritually attracted. And her parents doesn't have to be attracted to him because she has to be attracted to him. So my point is, if your family likes who you've chosen, it's a bonus. It's a bonus. It's nice. But it shouldn't, in my humble opinion, be a prerequisite. I know some of you might struggle with that. But I believe that's, and we learned that from, from the story of Rabbi Akiva because it was right for them to get married. And then... He did what, if any of you get married, please do not do. They're learning Torah and they were literally living in like in a, in a straw house and they were sleeping on the straw. And at a certain point she said to him, you're not going to be able to achieve the greatness you're going to be able to achieve with me in the room. You need just to go away like we did in Sfat just now. Get out, of the, get out of society. Get out of the forest. He was concerned about chopping woods and solemn bias. She said, you could, be, you could be anything. You need to go and learn Torah properly without me here. Just go. Just go. Go to Yeshiva properly. Go shy. Go learn. 
I'll, I'll sacrifice not being with you for a bit just for you to become great. How many people, how many of you ladies could you do that? And then my wife would be very happy, right? But, 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 but how many of you would, 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 would send off your husbands? She did. She did that. She did that. And he went off for how many years, do you know? 12 years. He went off initially for 12 years. 12 years, not like 12 days. How many of you like 12 days without WhatsApp? It's like, 12? And they didn't have WhatsApp. They didn't have Zoom. 12 years. That was the sacrifice. Listen to what happened, my friends. It's so deep. You have to sound from the Baal Shem Tov explanation what happened. He comes back with 12,000 of now his Talmudim. He, now he was already the king. He had 12,000 students. He's coming back with his 12,000 students to come and see his wife. Exciting moment, right? You haven't seen her for 12 years. He's putting a bit of weight, but he, he's hoping she won't notice. And, 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 and he's coming. And what does Hashem do? Her friend, obviously they don't know he's coming, is having a little chat with, with, with Rachel and saying, Rachel, aren't you upset with Akiva? He's meant to be this apparently great rabbi. How can he be a great rabbi? He's not with his wife. He's not with his wife. He's not treating his wife well. Do you know what Rachel said? She said to her friend, how dare you say Lashon about my husband? He's doing whatever he needs to do to help the Jewish people. And if he wanted to go and learn for another 12 years, I'd be only too happy. Rabbi Akiva heard that. So do you know what he did? He turned around and went back for another 12 years. Question is, and I'll just stop here and I'll take a little question and answer. Why didn't he at least go in and say, hi, darling, how's it going? You look even slimmer than ever. You're gorgeous. You haven't changed a bit. Have a bit of a hug. Have spent a, a week together, a month together, an hour together. He didn't go, he didn't say hello. You know, we teach the importance of being nice and being kind and caring about each other. And one of our greatest ever Jewish leaders hasn't seen his wife for 12 years. And he does a turnaround and comes back 12 years later. Can anyone like to give an explanation why he didn't go in and say hi? Saving her feelings and his feelings would be harder oh. to see each other and waste time from learning to her. So Johnny is, is the nice romantic auntie, the romantic, right? Like all the films. Can you imagine you go in and that heart, you can't leave again. That's not the answer. But, 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 but uh, maybe it is. Maybe that's, maybe it could be, could be. But that's not the classic answer, but I like it. Anyone else? Come on. Um, just think now deep, Kabbalistically, spiritually. Think like a tzaddik. Come on, Ran. Think like a tzaddik. From, from, from a tzaddik. You're a tzaddik? Go on, Eddie. be around the wife, then maybe it would have, like, lowered, like, he was on a high spiritual. He was. But eventually he goes back with her and they live happily ever after. So, so. They have children? Hmm. At that point, not. It's a good question. I need to look that up. But they did, yeah, if there's 24 years where there's no children, that's for sure. <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> no Let's hope not, right? So, um, yeah, there was, no, there was no children from them with those 24 years. Yeah. Well, I think I learned this before. Is it something like he didn't want to interrupt his learning, just good. having that interruption? Like, good. Says Reb Khan Shrelevis or Shiva of Mir, you can come again. He says the following. You think when Rabbi Akiva heard that, he thought for a second that was random? That was stum, a weird coincidence? He understood that's a message from Hashem to him to turn back because he, he knew when he went there, he was like, this is interrupting the learning, like we're on a roll here. We could go and achieve much, much more. And therefore, my friends, this is deep. 12 plus 12 does not equal 24. And if you say, yes, it does, it doesn't. I'll give you a proof. So we have probably one of the worst kettles in the world, world ever. Sorry, say Lashon about the kettle. But it's like, it takes about five minutes to boil, right? And it takes five minutes. And if you put it for two and a half minutes, stop. Two and a half minutes, it definitely won't boil. It's got to be five minutes consecutive. My dear friends, that's like when you're in the gym, right? If, if your trainer is saying you need to do a half an hour of this exercise to get fit. It can't be 15 minutes, stop, have a fag, another 15 minutes. That's not going to do it. It's the consecutiveness. Rabbi Kiva understood that to become what he needed to become, he couldn't stop. It's the, it's the non-stop. It's the endless. It's like 
you know, if you have learning, the Rambam, for example, says if you can learn for four hours straight, that's, if you go to, you know, one week straight, when you do something without any interruption, that's a whole different ball game from a little bit stop, a little bit stop, a little bit stop. And he understood that and he went, and here's what's the crazy thing. 24 years, 24,000 students. He comes out, he says hi to his wife, and they all die. Every single student dies. What is that about? They, can you imagine the 24 years of our greatest Jewish leader doing incredible things, and they all died, and that's the reason my beard is a little bit longer than normal, or a lot longer than normal. And that's the reason we haven't had any music in Abdallah over the past few weeks. That's the reason we're meant to mourn during the Sprata Omer, because this was the time of the year that they all died. There was tragedy after tragedy after tragedy. Many Kabbalists said, it's a bit chilling to say this, that two years ago, when 45 people died in Iran, it was a continuation of that plague. In fact, the way they died was called br- from a breathing illness. They stopped breathing, and the way the, the, the tragedy happened to Mehran is they stopped breathing. It's an, it was an illness called, I think, Askara was the, was the Aramaic word. And Rafilal Rafil says, it's not a coincidence that it happened on Lagba Omer, it happened during the Omer. This is, the, this is a very important time for spiritual growth, for working on your midot. And the Talmud says, why did they die? They had the best teacher ever. And they answer, anyone know? What's the Gemara famously answer why they died? So actually the phrase, Rezi, is Shela nahagu kavud zulazu. They didn't have enough respect for each other. They didn't have respect for each other. And there's a huge question, which is one of my big questions, which is the following. Rabbi Akiva, what does he stand for? What was his ethos? What's his kind of mission statement, you know? His yeshiva was all about love your friend like you love yourself. That's the main part of the Torah. Everything else is commentary. Don't do to another what you wouldn't have done to yourself. If he's teaching that, how can it be that that's the very crime that they all did, which made them all die? It makes no sense. <coughs> Any answers from the floor? I'm so deep in learning, they didn't practice it. Eh, you know, it's like you go to you go to a Harvard, you go to a Harvard and Ivy League university in England, Cambridge, Oxford. They all have their different ethoses. You know, the ethos of Ruby Kiva was always it's not just what you're learning. That's even the, the the insignificant part. The key thing is is to be a good person and to be kind. He was just ramming that down their throat, and yet that's what the problem was. Eh, sir. So this is very deep answers. One answer. That, that I fell in love with from the Shemi Shmuel, the soccer job of Rav. You know the problem? They loved each other too much. Let me explain. Sometimes you can love someone so much, you don't give them space to breathe. You don't give them space to be themselves. Shalona hagu kavud zarazu. It doesn't say sinat kinam. It says you didn't give them the space to be themselves. As a parent, one of the biggest challenges is you want your pet, your children to live a certain way, but it's their choice. And love sometimes means letting go. And love sometimes means say, being stum. And love sometimes means seeing what their passions and loves and interests are and helping them achieve their mission, not your mission. And a lot of parents make that mistake. They want to live through their kids. And the job of a parent is to love your children unconditionally. And in a marriage, and I see that sometimes with sometimes some of you know the, the, the singles in Tel Aviv make this mistake. They start going out, they start falling in love, and they start suffocating each other by saying, you've got to be like me. And I've, they start becoming almost codependent on each other and too much attached to each other. And my, my, my dear friends, take the advice from what happened, love doesn't mean attachment. Love doesn't mean codependence. Love means giving space for the other to be themselves. Don't look to change the other, look to love the other and celebrate your differences, not try and fix your differences. 
You're meant to be different. Your children will be different. Your friends will be different. And real love and respect is not just changing their minds or saying, I don't like what you're doing because it doesn't agree with your own ethos and philosophy. It's giving them the space to be themselves. That's real love. And that was maybe one of the mistakes that Rabbi Kiva's students made, which Rabbi Kiva then fixed. And here's the next point, Rabbi Akiva. If this was any of us, and your 24-year mission where you sacrificed your marriage has just gone up in smoke. That's the biggest trauma, right? Goodbye, good night. Everything you did, your legacy, he was, his hope was this was going to be the continuation of the oral law. He was not teaching just some students. He was hoping they were going to be the baton holders of the Jewish people. And they've all died, every single one. Do you know what most of us would do? Give up. Say, let's choose another job. I'm done. Obviously, Hashem, you don't love me or you don't like me. How many of us would quit? How many of you quit at work when things are tough? When things aren't going well? When the things you built gets destroyed and demolished? Rabbi Kiva never gave up. Next lesson from tonight, never give up, my friends, in your life. Never give up. If you're on your mission, if you're doing what you know you're meant to do, however hard it is, whatever the hurdles are, never give up. Rabbi Akiva went to 24,000 funerals. You know what that means? When I go to a shiver house, I can't cope it. You know, I start crying. To go to 24,000 shiver houses and still have the strength to say, I'm I'm not giving up. I, I, I know, says Rabbi Akiva, I need to keep on going because otherwise the Torah is not going to get passed. You know why we celebrate tomorrow night when it's a day really where we should be sad because so many people died during this time? Do you know why we celebrate? Because the baton did get passed to us through Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. He had five students. One of them, we went to two of them over the past few days. One of them is Rabbi Balanes, who went to on Friday and next in Tiberias. The one with the stucker box was one of his students and the other... Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, and he had five students. He changed philosophy. He went from quantity to quality. He goes, okay, let's just pick a few <laughs> diamonds and just work with them. They, they should be killed for over love. Who, them? The students. It's a bit of a harsh... Oh, Frank, harsh. question. Yeah. 100%, 100%. It does sound very harsh. I didn't say I understand it. I didn't say it makes sense. It says in the Torah, Hanistarot l'ashem elokeinu. And by the way, if you thought that was harsh... What about our hero, our Sadiq, who Moshe Rabbeinu says is greater than him, who when the Romans came and they banned the learning of Torah, said the famous parable, which I love, I really like this parable. This is a good one, Ron, remember this? He says there's, there was, he says the way I have to, because he kept on teaching Torah, he didn't stop. So he, they said, how can you, what are you doing? They're going to kill you. He used the parable of the fish and the fox. You know this one? where the fish are in the sea and they're swimming around and there's a fox that comes to the shore and sees the little fishes and starts having a little conversation with the fishes like you do. And it says to the fishes, look at all this space here next to me. Why don't you come and chill out with me here? You're all like claustrophobic in the sea with all, look, there's so much space for you here. Come, let me look after you, let's play. So the fishes said to the fox, we might be fishes, but we're not stupid. At least here, yes, we've got these fishermen, they're trying to kill us and this very claustrophobic, but we're, we're, we're alive, we're breathing. The moment we come out the sea, yes, there's no fishermen trying to catch us, but we know we're dead straight away because without water, we're dead. Says Rabbi Akiva, what keeps the Jewish people alive is Torah. This isn't, Torah's not a history book. Torah's not a constitution. It's not a rule book. It's our spiritual life. We have to change our perception. It's, it's, it's a soul book. It's a, it's a book which helps us breathe. Just like the word breathing, neshima, comes from the word neshama. Torah is Torah chayim. It's what gives us a life. It's what kept my father alive for years when he was super ill. It's what gave him vitality at the end of chemo. He started, he was actually, during chemo, he was there with a the sefer. I used to go and sit in the hospital learning chavrotu with him. During chemo. You're alive, you learn Torah. Done. 
And what happened to this hero in the end? What was his great hero's ending? The Romans came and butchered him to death. In the most traumatic, disgusting, awful, hideous, heinous way. Where they were combing him to death with metal combs, prolonging his agony, putting cotton wool over him just to keep on going. And you know what he said every step of the way? Bring it on! Baruch Hashem! And then at the state of the last, what was the last moments of his life? He said, oh, Hashem, thank you so much. I've always wanted to say the Shema properly. Hashem, I should love you with all my heart and giving up my life for you. Thank you, Romans, for allowing me to say the Shema properly. And he said, Shema, and he passed away. At that point, Moshe Rabbeinu stormed into Hashem, says the Talmud. He says, Hashem, enough. What are you doing? He says, Zu Torah, Vzu Shara. He's Torah, and this is the reward for someone who's our hero of Torah. You know what Hashem said to him? Shutok, shut up. Zu Midat Adin. This is called Midat Adin. Meaning, if Moshe Rabbeinu in Gan Eden doesn't understand, us mere mortals don't understand reality sometimes. It's okay to say, Ani Lomevin. Moses can say, Ani Lomevin. We can say at times, I don't understand. Say, I don't understand. It's okay to say, I don't understand. At any rate, his students, Rib Shimon Ba Yochai, is also struggling with these Romans. The band Torah. A very famous episode now bringing to the Rashbi in Lagba Om. A very, very famous episode happened that the Rashbi was with his friends in the mikvah. They're having a little chat and one of his friends said to him, those Romans, they're fantastic. Yeah, they're, they're really awesome. They've built the most beautiful roads and bathhouses. This bathhouse, we couldn't be in without the Romans. We should really go and say thank you. The Rashbi looked at him. The Rashbi was someone who was you know, mucking about. He was only a person of truth and looked at him and said, Ma Tom. they didn't do it for us. They did it for them. They really did it to have lots of prostitutes here. That's why they did it. They didn't do it for us. There was this naughty man, Rudolf ben Geira, who went and reported to the Romans what Rav Shem Bayochai said. It's what we call in Hebrew a moisa. He was a talebearer, and the Romans, ah, this Jewish leader saying that, off with his head. Whoever finds him gets a lot of rewards. We find him, he kill him straight away. Rav Shem Bayochai. He has to run away. He has to leave his wife. Twelve years, he's sitting in a cave. We were in a cave this Shabbat. It wasn't a coincidence, it was a cave. Twelve years in a cave. Big miracle happens. If you're living in a cave, away from society, how do you eat? What did Hashem do? What was the miracle? A carob tree. tree and a stream. How do you say it in English? Or is it carob? A carob. C-A-R-O-B. Not very nice. It's one of the worst, most dis- untasteful. It's like okay, but it's really not generally right. So, and uh, but here's the thing: they just gave him what he. By the way, that was a miracle within a miracle because normally it takes a carrot tree seventy years to grow. It's straight away, it's ripe straight away, and that's what sustains him for twelve years. He's learning underground, under the sand. He takes. He's only got one pair of clothes. He has them off. Most of the day, so we can learn Torah with an angel, with a malach, and Eliyahu Navi is teaching him with his son, Rebbe Lazar, and then they put on their clothes to go and pray. Twelve years, he's under the sand. And finally, Eliyahu Navi comes in and says, and says, it's time to leave. You can leave now. The Roman emperor is dead. The decree is over. Shimon Bayochai comes out with his son, Rebbe Lazar, and you have to understand, he's been learning the Zohar. That's where the Zohar was taught by the angels to him. That's where our famous <laughs> Zohar was revealed in the cave, under the sand. And he comes out in society and sees the world from a different eyes. And his eyes were like these X-ray eyes, like in the Superman films. And as soon as he saw people sinning, he just looked at them. Hey, Jesse, he looked at Come and sit next to me if you were here. Sit here. And, and, and he looked at them and... He was just, he started killing people with his eyes. I mean, he didn't mean it. People started dying. And he had a heavenly voice come and say, Rabbi Shimon Bayochai, get back in that cave. I haven't let you out to kill my world. Quickly back in, you're not ready yet. He had to go back in the cave for another, anyone know how long? Another year, one more year. He says, why was it a year? Because Gehenna is only for a year, which is, by the way, why we, why we have Kaddish just for 12 months. Because maximum you can be going through suffering is 12 months. 
After 12 months, it's just with Hashem in a beautiful way. 12 months, a bit of rehab might be needed. Not for anyone. Huh? Not for anyone. No. <laughs> Sadiqim don't have to go through that. But, so he had to go through that 12 months and he comes out and now he's ready. And now he's ready. A famous story of Pinchas ben Ya'ir. There's an argument with his father-in-law, his son-in-law, sees him, gives him a hug, and then sees his terrible rashes and scars from the sand. Terrible blisters. It's blistered up. And he starts crying and he starts, creates pain for the Rashbi and the Rashbi cries. He says, what are you doing? And Pinchas ben Ya'ir says, I can't believe you've had to go through what you've gone through. You know what the Rashbi said? If not for these scars, I couldn't have received the Zohar. Which, let me share with you what that means. You know, someone asked me tonight, how do we access spirituality? How do we access that oneness with Hashem? We have to erode our ego. We have to sometimes go through pain. We have to go through humbling experiences. It's not, nothing good comes easy. If you really want to grow, it's not going to be easy. There's going to be things you've got to give up. There's got to be things. You can't have it all. I know we're in Tel Aviv and kind of on one hand, we've got it all, right? You've got the beach. You've got the shoal. You've got, you got it all. But if you really want to grow, if you really want to grow, there's certain things you, you know, I really believe in that please God, hopefully that the blessings and success we're going to have in Tel Aviv comes as a consequence of me and my wife. Really, it's hard for us to be without our kids and grandkids. Because that show wasn't easy at all. In fact, my wife was like, no way are we coming because that's the logical thing. And then Hashem put into both of our heads, okay, but we can do really beautiful things here. So to deepen, it's like, okay. And even though, you know, Leia is always so excited when we go back to London, it's like, oh, my house again. I can come back to my house because that's our house. Nice to see you, Crystal, just coming in. He used to live in our house. Nice to see you, Crystal, there. And, and, at the end of the day, you've got to sometimes, if you want to, if you want to achieve things, you can't have it all. You, can't, have, you can't, can't live in your comfort zone in easy streets and grow and do beautiful things. And Rabbi and Rabbi Shimba Yochai understood that and he was willing to take the pain to get the gain of the Zohar. So in short, tonight, in the year 4,000, 1,783 years ago, as I said, tomorrow night, like tonight, on your test ER in 23 hours time, Rabbi Shimba Yochai is finally realizing his time's up and starts. Hashem saying to him, now you, can, now you can give over. The sun didn't set. It's one of the reasons we light fires. It just kept on sun. The sun kept going. And he kept on revealing the Zohar and revealing the Zohar and revealing the Zohar. And the sun's writing and writing and writing and writing and writing until the last words, which finally he then passed away. And by the way, I really feel tomorrow night, or sometime at least over Lagba Omer, have a little look at Zohar. And on Safari, you can have one with English. And even the first one, the first one, I think is very accessible. It talks about why you have to hold your Kiddush cup with your five fingers like that. It's really accessible. And that's one of the things about the Ariya Kadosh. He's made the Zohar more accessible. We're living in a generation where we need to have more access. I disagree with the Kabbalah Center saying it's just, you know, just scanning it is a good use of time. We can do better than that. We can do a lot better than that. Yes, have it in your house and find maybe teachers who can really teach it to you. But I believe... There's so many other very important stagim, which is based in the Zohar, which we should learn first before we can dive into it. But tomorrow night's huge. It's a time of big Yeshuot. It's a time of big salvations. And let's just finish off with giving you a few tips of how to access the day. Tip number one. From the Kudoshis Levi, Levi Yitzhak Abedichev. He says, why do we like fires? Tomorrow night, you know, it's funny. And we apologize, myself and Sherry, my wife apologize to you that we've changed our location for Lagba Omer twice. We're about to change it for a third time. It's Hashem. Why? Because in, in the lovely, holy city of Tel Aviv, they don't like people lighting bonfires on Lagba Omer. They're making it very hard for people to light bonfires. So they're saying, you can't have it there and you can't have it there. So we said, can we have it there? So in the end, we found some places where we can do, you can do some places in Tel Aviv. You're allowed to, bar- you're allowed to barbecue, but not a bonfire. So we found a few places. We found um, by the park, we can do a bonfire. Then we thought by the Hilton. 
And in my neshama, I'm like, yeah, but Rav Shem Bayachai wants us to light a bonfire. We have to light a bonfire. So we're going to light a bonfire. So we're going to go where we're legally allowed to light a bonfire, which we'll let you know very soon. We'll put in the thing, which is by the port. And it's going to be beautiful. And we're going to light a bonfire. And hopefully the police aren't going to come and take us away and put us in the prison. And, 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 and it'll be worth it because the fire will be your... You know, I've told some of you when I go to Rav Shem Bayachai, and last night when I was there, I'm mamash... It's like some people see different colors when you go to different tzaddikim. Sometimes they see blue and white. Always Rav Shem Bayachai, I see fire. And, and the fire was there. Zohar means that light, means that fire. And that says the Kodesh's lady, what's the fire you can access? And he says the following. There's a verse in last week's parasha which says the following. Bat ish kohen, the daughter of a kohen, which the Bedichava says is referring to your neshama. Ki techel is not... When, sh- when the Yitzhahara gets your soul, you know that moment when your lower self starts winning and starts like leading you astray? Hashem is, you're making Hashem upset every time you sin. Hashem is like, really? Do you know how you succeed? Light a fire! Light a fire in your heart, my friends. Light a fire in your soul. What does that mean? I believe one of the reasons that people are falling out of love with Judaism is because people aren't passionate enough about it. Too many people in previous generations, do you know why they do it? Because their father did it, and their father did it, and they're kind of just like going through the motions. And I see in synagogue, and it's very interesting, and do this experiment when you, I like, like objectively watching reality. Watch how people walk in the street, where they walk to, how they walk, the pace they walk. It's amazing. When people walk to synagogue, they start going slower. And they start talking. And they're taking their time. And it's lethargic. And then they even go into synagogue and the, con- the talking continues. You know? Not that I would know this, but you tell me when people go to the clubs. There's a big club and it's all happening. There's excitement and there's movement. And the body's moving fast and shh. Until the queue happens, and then you'll stop, right? But, 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 but there's, there's this like, passion, you know. I love my football. Sports is going to games. They're running. They're running to the game. They want to be a minute late. The more you love something, the more you're passionate about it. Says the Kaddish lady, you want to beat your Yitzhahara? You've got to be more passionate than your Yitzhahara. Your Yitzhahara is the most passionate thing in the world at getting you to sin. You want to win? You've got to be more passionate. Which means when you go to synagogue, when you do a mitzvah, when you give charity... Do it with your body. Why do we talk with our hands? Why, if you see me in synagogue, would you see me sometimes you're really shaking and moving and we're calling it the shockle? You know, the rabbi shockle. Do you know why we do the rabbi shockle? To, 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 to make the neshama wake up. To show to Hashem we're passionate, we're excited about what we're doing. We're not just doing it because you know, we have to. Yeah, all right, let's finish. You'd like that? Done. You've got to do it with passion. And that's the Kudushas Levi's way of trying to access some of the magic of Lagba Omer. Next idea is the following. My friends, tomorrow night at our bonfire, or maybe when you go back home, or maybe go to the sea at night, like we did on, on, on the night of the Shirag. It's a beautiful place to pray by the sea. Have a moment to pray. And when you pray, this is where you do it. Before you do that, you give charity in the merit of Shumba Yochai. You light a candle for Shumba Yochai. If you can, make a little re- resolution on Lagba Omer. I'm going to try and do X. And then you pray and say, Rabbi Shimba Yochai, I've now paid you to be my advocate, my lawyer. And then you talk to Hashem. You don't dub him to the tzaddik, you dub him to Hashem. What we did last night, for those of you who were who with me, who went to Rabbi Shimba Yochai, we need to do it again, right, Iris? We need to do it again because we didn't do it on Lagba Omer. There's something special about doing it on Lagba Omer. And now the Rashbi knows you. He's like, ah, Manish Machoti, come. I remember, I know you asked that already, but said I haven't forgotten. And the Alza. So, 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 a famous story, Rabbi Biederman says, you like this story, he, someone's, you know, there at the cave, and the last night, I'm telling you, it was Bedlam, and this was two nights ago, like, this is like two nights before, like, but Omer, there was like a hundred people, like, before the tomb, and one of the advantages about being small is I can weave myself in to the front, and so I'm starting to weave in and all these like tall guys, like, where have you come from? Where have you come from? And, I, and I'm there. And before you know it, I'm like four away. And then I'm waiting and I'm waiting and I go. 
and, and even last night you saw this sometimes very high places, very, very high spiritually charged places like Uman, I find very similar. Sometimes it's like crazy people walking around. So it was this crazy guy that got to the front of Hashem Bayachai. And there was this very, very, very wealthy American businessman who was there. Who was, finally got to the front. And he's now talking to, talking to Hashem. And he's talking, holding and this other guy. Starts doing the following. Rabbi Shimon Bayachai, I need $50,000. I need $50,000 now. And he starts screaming in this wealthy businessman's ear. And this wealthy businessman has been waiting for a cue to finally get in and have his moment of us, And he's being shouted at by this crazy Meshuggah saying, ask him the rush be, like he could, to give him $50,000. So in the end, the wealthy business, true story, the wealthy businessman thought, you know what? I'm going to pay a little joke on this guy because he's really annoying, really annoying. And he quickly got up and he opened up his eyes and looked at him and said, Rabbi Shem Bayahai just spoke to me. He just spoke to me. He said, done. So he says, you need to give me your address and then he'll send you the check if you leave right now. If you just leave this room right now, give me the address. Rabbi Shem Bayahai will send it to you. And the guy was so crazy. He thought, okay, great. He's obviously got a good chat with the Rashbi and he gave him his address. He wrote down his address. He left the room. He could now have a nice little chat to Hashem. End of story. Apart from three weeks later, when our crazy man received $50,000. Because the wealthy businessman's whole plan was to sign it, Rabshun by Yochai. It's not going to bank. But he forgot. He signed it his name. And the guy cashed the check. So true story, the guy cashed the $50,000. And afterwards, when, when the wealthy guy realized that it's gone, he spoke to his Rebbe, what do I do? His Rebbe said, you had the staka. That was rubbish man by Yachai. The guy wasn't crazy after all. He was 100% right. He asked rubbish man by Yachai, and rubbish man by Yachai saw you as about staka. And he said, oh, you're going to give it to him. You thought you were playing a trick on him. Really, I was playing a trick on you. And you gave staka, which you could. Baruch Hashem, you gave staka. And that's what this Rebbe said to him. Which means you go and daven to Rav Shumba Yochai. You're going to get answers. By hook or by crook. You'll get your answers. You'll get your Yeshuot. And really ask for what you can. By the way, I got literally a call a few hours ago saying there's a bus leaving Tel Aviv at 12.30 for, the, for anyone who wants to do like a, an all-nighter at Meron. So we're allowed to be part. Our, our JTRV are allowed to be part of the... The select buses we've been chosen. We won the raffle. If we want to be in 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 Meron tomorrow night, so maybe Ilan will go back. Probably he will. <laughs> Ilan, if it's a JTLV bus, he'll be there because he comes to everything we do, Baruch Hashem. And 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 you're all invited. I just want to finish one last thing, and then we'll, then we'll go for the sushi and, and just bring it back to my dad. And it's a beautiful chasm so far, and and it kind of I think it's very poignant to my father, and we'll try and make it poignant to you. Says the Chasm so for the following. There's something that happens in the Torah on Lag Ba'omer. Anyone know? I'll be very impressed. You get your choice of sushi if anyone is the answer to this. What happened in the Bible, in the Old Testament, in the Torah on Lag Ba'omer, on the 18th of Iyar? No. <laughs> <laughs> or AI, you can't ask chat. But you heard it maybe last year, Crystal. But I'll give you the first thing of sushi. Go on, Crystal. People stop dying. No, I mean, the other people, not in the Torah. The Rabbi Kiva students died in the year 2,000 years ago, right? We're talking about 3,300 years ago, minus something actually happened in the Old Testament on the 18th of Iyar. Go on. All right. Very good. This is my student from London, everybody. He's come all the way from London. And he's now, now and you see, this is Crystal. All right, yeah? What happened? So, uh, let me explain. It says in the Torah that you read that Haman, when Hashem brought down manna from heaven, the first day it came down was Lag Ba'omer. Not a stam, they lost stam. What is manna from heaven? Manna, it, was, it was the food we ate for 40 years in the desert. This miracle, white snowflakes that could taste however, if you wanted to taste like sushi, it could taste like sushi. If you wanted to taste like caviar, it tastes like caviar. Personally, I'd go for steak and chips. And, and, and that you could make as Coke, right? That's what it would taste like. It was a miracle. Total miracle. We were, by the way, it's deep. You know, normally you're so worried about where am I going to eat? How am I going to afford to eat? Hashem sustains you now through Derech HaTeva, through the natural ways. In the time, it was made Al It was a total miracle. And that's the way he sustained us. And it came down on Lag Ba'omer. That's what's going to be coming down. The snowflakes are coming down. Let's explain now why it's relevant. 
The Talmud says, why dafka lagba omer? And what's it got to do with Rabbi Shimon by Yochai? What's the correlation with Rabbi Shimon by Yochai? Oi, the Rashbi and, and Yurida Saman says the Chasm Sofa so deep. My dear friends, there's two types of Torahs. And some of you, maybe tell me afterwards which one you're drawn to. Some of you I know, some of you I'm not sure yet. Some people, like my father and my wife, are drawn to the Torah of Moshe Rabbeinu. The Torah of practicality. The Torah of halacha. The Torah of, of, of foundations and facts and, 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 and the overt material part of the Torah. That was Moshe Rabbeinu. My father was a quintessential <coughs> learner of the Rambam, Maimonides. He was the ultimate rationalist. He, he just loved halacha, rationale, Rambam. He was a Moshe Rabbeinu yid. And then there's a Rabbi Shimon Bayocha yid, which is <coughs> what really attracts the soul is what's beneath the surface. It's not the what, but the why. It's not the now, but it's the then. It's not the here, but it's the there. It's the, it's the higher world. It's the inner world. It's the mystical world. This is what happens, my friends. The first 32 days of Svirat Omeh. You know, it's 49 days of Svirat Omeh. The numerical value, Lev Tov, a good heart. Lev is numerical value 32. Tov is numerical value 17. This is wild stuff, everybody. Listen to this. Lev Tov, which is the Birkei Yavet, says what the most important thing we, we can do in life is to have a good heart. It says all the personality traits you can have, the most important personality trait is a Lev Tov, a good heart. The Lev is 32. We're now on day 32 of the Omer, soon. Right? This is 32. We're, we're in the, the Lev zone. This is the Moshe Rabbeinu. This is Hamotzi Lechem Min Haaret time. This is physical. Tomorrow night, mm-mm, we ascend to Amotzi Lechem Min HaShomayim, which is the blessing they made on the man. It's a good quiz question. Most people wouldn't know that. What's the blessing on man? It wasn't Shehako. It was Hamotzi Lechem Min HaShomayim. Thank you, Hashem, for me the Lechem Min HaShomayim. What Lag Ba'omer is in every year, it's always been and will always be. Hashem gives you divine help. My dear friends, if you want to get close to Hashem, it's two-thirds you and one-third Hashem. It's 32 you, 17 Hashem. It's 32 days of work, day in, day out. There's 24 years of Rabbi Kiva striking away, away from his wife, building, building, building. But at a certain point, Hashem says, okay, now let me take over. My dear friends, you will all feel it's like you've been, you've been pushing since Pesach, the trolley uphill. You know, in Sfat, there's a lot of hills. There's a lot of steps. There's a lot of going up. And it's, for a 51-year-old grandfather, it wasn't easy. He likes his coke. It was not easy going up those steps. But then ever so often, sometimes you start going down again. You're going to feel a shift of energy tomorrow night. Where what you found really hard, please God, is going to start being really easy. You've got 17 days of easy, meaning you've got to ask. Hashem, help me with this. Help me with that. Help me with the other. It's coming down. Mon is coming down from tomorrow night. So you read us Hamon time. That can be in areas of trying to work things out in Torah. It can be areas, please God, if you really want in, in your Zugiot, in, instead of having another bad date and another bad date and not even a bad date. It could well be you're not even going to need a date and you're going to like meet your loved one. Done. Sago. Hashem wants that, it will be that. And this 17 days in livelihood. How many of you, sometimes you send another message to this person, another message to this person, another message to this person, and you're getting nowhere in business, and then ever so often something comes to you. My dear friends, you should be excited. Because the 17, you've got 17 days of awesomeness coming up. 17 days of Hamotzi Lecha Min 17 days of Rib Shimon by Yochai's Torah coming and just being so accessible to you. And you know, just to finish off with, I never understood. My dad really wasn't into mysticism at all. Whenever I'd go mystical with him, he said, I can't get my head around what you're saying. Why did he die, I asked Hashem, just before Lagba Omer? 
made no sense to me. Like, if he would have died, I would have thought, his your site should have been on Shavuot. He was all about the giving of the Torah. He was all about, he loved Pesach. You know, he loves Rosh Hashanah. He used to be the belt fit on Rosh Hashanah. <sighs> on Yom Kippur. He could have gone then. Why did Hashem choose to take him? And then I came to me in my head, in my heart. Now I understand, based on this chasm sofa. His job was the lev. In fact, he passed away through his heart. He, he had cancer, but it wasn't the cancer that ended his life. The, the, the excess amount of chemotherapy, his heart failed. His lev, he finished his lev. Hashem said, you did your job. Now it's the Rashbi's time to take over. That wasn't my dad's mission. I think it was obviously in Hashem's eyes, the right time for my father who, who taught halakha, who taught Torah, who taught the Torah of Moshe Rabbein, who loved, loved, loved the, the authentic, overt part of the Torah. When the 32nd day of the Omer is finished, Hashem said, no, you can come with me to Shemayim. You've done your job. It's now Hamotzilechem in Hashemayim time. You know, my father passed. It was the strangest thing. He gave me one thing to do, one thing. I said, Avi, just make sure I get buried. You're in charge of the burial. So I said, fine. And I, you know, how hard it is. And I was very on it. And straight, straight away, straight after he passed, I said, I need the, the documents and I need the letter. Then I need to, you know, to write down the right documentation. I'd spoken to the Hebrew Kedisha. They were all going to come. Everything. I thought I did everything. And then I got a call from the coroner saying, we've got a bit of a problem. Um, um, Avi, we can't release his body. I said, I said, what do you mean? They said the report that the specialist has written has said there's been excess chemotherapy, which causes heart to fail. We need to find out, has there been malpractice? Has there been problems? I spoke to my mom, I spoke to my sister, my brother. We don't care. We just need to bury him. He wants to be buried straight away. You should know the neshama doesn't like it when it's in limbo. When a soul leaves the body, bury them as up, me yad. We don't muck about. You shouldn't be mucking about. The neshama needs it. The neshama's got nowhere to go. The neshama just needs to be with Hashem. We're now in the body. The body. The neshama leaves the body. Let's put him with Hashem. It's the biggest mitzvah. It's called a met mitzvah. Someone who's not buried, bury them as at within an hour. In Eretz Yisrael, sometimes within an hour, two hours, they're buried. He passed on, I think, on a Monday. By Tuesday afternoon, me and my sister and my brother are now sitting outside the coroner's office, waiting to meet this lovely lady called Mary Hassel and saying, we need to release my father. Otherwise, I'm just going to send the boys in. We're just going to get him anyway. We're going to find a way to think... You know, they put my father in a fridge and he needs to be buried. And by the way, someone who's a mourner is not allowed to do a mitzvah until you bury the father, until you bury your so I, You couldn't do tefillin. You couldn't, like a lot of people would be very happy not doing tefillin in the bracha. But for me, it was not easy. And, and, and like, where are you? I'm in limbo. I'm in limbo. What do you do? Actually, my Rebbe, so, so I went to coroner and, and she wouldn't even come out to see us. Very nice. And, and she left us in the cold there for, for hours. And finally, we were basically told, because of COVID, because it happened just at the beginning of COVID, there's a huge list. We'll get to your dad in a few weeks. And at that point, I realized, Avi, you like doing events and projects? Now we've got to do Project Rescue My Dad. And I spoke to my Rebbe. And he said, I'm no longer an Onain because there's nothing I can do. So I have to go on now with doing my mitzvahs. You're only an Onain when you're waiting. And he said, it's not up to you to bury your dad now. You have to keep on with the mitzvahs and now daven and make blessings. And there's nothing you can do. You have to wait. I said, no, I'm not waiting. And I literally created a political campaign where I got to the prime minister. This Mary Hassel didn't know what hit her. She was literally getting calls initially from the chief rabbi, but then from the Lord Justice, from a guy called Michael Gove, who works for the prime minister, the justice minister. This Bobby Hill, this Bobby Hill. She's like, who is this Bobby Hill? But she was tough. She's a toughie. And she had this very, <coughs> she, unfortunately, she was renowned for not releasing Jewish bodies. She's very famous for it in the, in the UK. How she oversaw a religious neighborhood is disgusting. 
But obviously it was from Hashem. And this is obviously what Hashem decided. And what my father did in his death, he did in his lifetime, which is bring the Jewish people together. Every type of Jew in the UK got together. From Haredi to secular, from the board of deputies to politicians. My dad, in his death, did what he did in his life. He united UK Jewry. And we all fought a huge campaign against this crazy woman. And then Hashem decided, in his infinite wisdom, I get a call Friday morning. You can come now. We got to it. He can go now. And Baruch Hashem, just before Shabbat, my dad had his wish. And we're not allowed to do a eulogy. My dad kept saying, no Hesperd, no eulogies, no eulogies. Guess what? You're buried on a Friday afternoon. You're not allowed to do a eulogy. Guess what? He didn't want a big fast. It was COVID. No one could go to the funeral apart from me and nine others. And just nine others. We had nine, ten men. And in Kabbalah, they say if someone's buried normally, it's, there's something called chibu kakeve, which is the maggots are allowed to go and bite them. On Friday afternoon, someone's buried Friday afternoon. It says Sadiqim are buried Friday afternoon and no maggots can touch you. You're rescued from Chibo Kakeva being buried on a Friday afternoon and Hashem and his infinite wisdom understood that my dad, we needed that week. I don't, we know, I'll know one day why this happened. It was very, very painful. It was awful. I was, there was a big, the London Bet Din, head of Bet Din. I was crying my eyes out to him on the phone. It wasn't his fault. I, was, I couldn't get my words out. I'm just... Can you help? And then he sent it. He's like, I can see this is serious. And he sent this letter to her and everyone's sending letters to her. But Hashem decided and he got buried on Friday and it was very strange. The first year, this wasn't his yurt site. I'll teach you halakha. The first year, the yurt site is the year after burial. He was buried five days later. But then it reverts to the day he passes. So the day he passed is right now. So in short, just to say to my dad, who's over here, this is my father here with my mum. This is this big Sadiq from London who been Yomim Ben Beryl Lev, who changed the life of thousands and thousands of people and um, say, Dad, I love you and, and uh, you should be now with your friends in Shemaim. I know he's with probably Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. They were good friends and with many of his friends up there and he's actually with the Rambam. I'm sure he's in the Rambam Sushiva now. And I felt him very much over Tzfat. And it's a shame. I feel that a lot of the strength we'll have will be because we've got angels fighting for us in, in the higher worlds. We should only be merit smachot. And, and my father should have an aliyah shama and all the mitzvot we've done today. He should receive tremendous merit for that. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to have.